Well, here we are at last. Here's the final exam review. I hope you all will find it helpful in um, studying for our final that is coming up. And here you see it, the beginnings of it. First of all, note um, basic definitions and terms. So notice the major definition terms for um, our for STAT 250 and how to use them also, how they're used in context. You have to know what the population, what that means, um, what we mean by a sample, which is just a, basically a subset of the population. You draw a sample from the population. You need to know what descriptive statistics are and inferential statistics and the difference. Now, descriptive statistics are um, what we did at the very start of the class, when we took graphs, when we made graphs, when we calculated values for the measures of center and the measures of spread. Looking at these graphs and looking at the spread, we could tell something about the distribution, its shape, um, deviations from the overall pattern. We could see from some of the graphs and um, do some data analysis. Those um, looking at the data itself um, is what I mean. So that's descriptive statistics. Inferential statistics is where you take those descriptive statistics and you're going to use them so that you can make inferences about a population. In other words, maybe educated guesses about the population or try to predict what's going to happen or what is going on with the population. You also have to know what the different variables in statistics. And remember, we can take on, there can be variable values and we also have things called random variables where they have um, a distribution. But a variable is either categorical or quantitative. Categorical means that it tells some kind of quality about something. So I could say my random variable is the color of shirts of people sitting in a gymnasium. So it would be red, blue, green, yellow, things like that. That would be considered categorical. Quantitative has to do with quantities, um, counts, or measurements. So a variable or a random variable can be quantitative. Now quantitative has two subcategories in and of itself. So you can have a discrete a quantitative variable or quantitative random variable or a continuous variable or a continuous random variable. Discrete or counts. Frequencies. They're where you can literally take your finger and count things. A continuous random variable is a measurement, anything that could be put on a scale, anything that could, you could put a tape measure to, anything that you measure is considered continuous. A, a nice way to try to differentiate the two. So you'll, have, you'll be asked things like that, like um, the number of cars that go down the road um, and, and on a Sunday afternoon, and you literally count the cars that go through. That would be a discrete um, variable. If I said um, the heights of everybody, all my online students, we're talking about a continuous variable. Now, we're also going to talk about um, parameters and statistics. You have to know what they are. Very important because statistics are used to estimate parameters. So a parameter defines a population. It's going to tell you what the population mean is, population standard deviation, and population proportion. But normally we don't know these things. So we take a sample and we estimate them. So x bar is the sample mean and it estimates mu, the population mean. S is the sample standard deviation. It estimates sigma, the population standard deviation. P hat, which is the sample proportion, estimates P, the population proportion. So we dealt with these extensively, especially toward the end when we were doing inferential statistics where we had to take these statistics and we build an interval about it um, so that we can have an interval that hopefully contains the population parameter. Um, or we took from a sample either x bar or p hat and we tested, um, we were trying to test a particular value we think a parameter is based on a sample to see whether it, it takes on that value or, or something's happening to it. So we've been, we've been dealing with these quite a bit. You also have to know, and I kind of went out of order, sampling distributions, what are they? Well, we did that example when I was doing the grades of um, a student in classes, and I showed you that if you take a sample of a specific size from your population and you get every sample possible of that size, every possible combination of people or things, 
that we found out that for samples of a particular size, if I took the means of all those different samples, it ended up being the mean of the population. So our sampling distribution was a way for us to estimate our population mean. So all our inferential statistics that we've done for parameters on um, parametric tests were based on the sampling distribution. Um, also understand the central limit theorem. That says that as my sample size increases, my sampling distribution becomes approximately normal even if the population is not normally distributed. And if you remember the slides on that where we had a, remember we had a population that was highly skewed, but when we did sampling distributions and our sample sizes became larger than 30, that sampling distribution became approximately normally distributed. So the central limit theorem is very powerful for us and helps us so that we can do inferential statistics um, for quite a few situations, many, many situations. The law of large numbers, understand what that means. And it, it applies to many different things. Um, if my sample size is large, it gets larger and larger. My statistic um, takes on values closer to the population mean, or can. Um, if, my, uh, if we're doing probability, the more times I do something, the more the uh, probability is seen. In other words, flipping a coin. If I flip a coin four times, I literally could see a head four times. But we know that to flip a coin, you have a 50-50 chance of getting a head or tail. Well, if I do it over and over and over again, let's say a thousand times, we'll get closer to the 500-500. I might see 499 and 501, but we'll get closer to the 50-50 mark the more we do something. Understand what the confidence level is, how we use that to get our confidence interval. Understand a type 1 and type 2 error. Type 1 is rejecting the null hypothesis when in fact it's true. And type 2 is not rejecting the null hypothesis when we should have, when, the null, um, when in fact the null was not true. So you see this little table that I made here. What is true? Well, H0 is true or the um, alternative is true. And what you did goes along the column, the first column, that you rejected H0 or did not. So you see, if you do not reject H0 and H0 was true, you didn't do anything wrong. Also, if you rejected H0 when the alternative was true, that was no error. But our type 2 error comes from that one diagonal where we don't reject H0 when, in fact, the alternative was true 